on a hill far away there stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so I'll change trophies at last I lay down and I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange for a crown. It stood on a hillside, an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering for sinners that were lost. His bloodshed was eminent. To crucify, they were bound. He wore a crown of thorns destined for heaven's crown. They mocked and smote him. They placed thieves by his side. My God, why hast thou forsaken? He cried before he died. They wrapped him in linen, placed him in a borrowed tomb. They rolled a great stone in the doorway to entomb. On the third day they came at the rising of the sun. The stone was rolled away. They could not hold God's son. On that old rugged cross, his blood stains washed away. All the sins in this world, he surely lives today. Thank you, Lord. For that old cross, you made the ultimate sacrifice. Like the thief on the cross, I'll see you in paradise. Hey, well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Temple Online. Thanks for joining us. And I hope that you had a great Mother's Day last week. And today we're going to be uh, starting a new series of messages that uh, from, and, and we're going to look in Ezekiel chapter 37. So uh, today in, in this part one, we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 37. So go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. I want to share with you some memes that I found that'll go along with what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this, uh, this meme, you got Tim Hawkins here. I'm, I'm sure he must have said this uh, in, in one of his uh, comedic lines. He said, want to be left alone? Go to the mall and hold a clipboard. True, right? True, those people can be so annoying holding those clipboards at the mall. And in fact, they're very persistent. And that's what we're going to talk about here in this series. We've entitled it Persist. Uh, persist. Speaking of persist, sometimes we persist with other people in a lot of ways. Uh, this meme says, don't argue with people on social media. Every classroom had a kid that ate paste. That's probably who you're arguing with. True, true. Speaking about arguing, this one I thought was kind of funny. The plumber said, why haven't you paid the bill for the work that I did last Friday? Patty replied back, well, it's not what you quoted. The plumber said, well, I didn't give you a quote. Patty replied back, yes, you did. When I asked what day you could come, you said you were free on Friday. Got to watch the way you say things, I guess, right? Took it pretty literal. 
I love this uh, comic strip, and uh, I, so I find a lot of funny memes from here. Earl says, you know what, Opal? You're a chocoholic. Opal said, that's not true. I could live without chocolate. I could get along just fine without chocolate. Everybody around me would suffer, but I'd be fine. A lot of truth there, right? In fact, last week, that's what we did. We gave the ladies a lot of chocolate, so hopefully everybody's in good shape. Well, the Cardinals aren't doing so hot, unfortunately, this year. It's been kind of a sad year for us as a team, as St. Louis Cardinals. And it kind of reminded me of this particular meme. The pitcher is is there, and, and he says, I just think it'd be nice if you'd visit when I was doing well, too. You know, they always come out when something, when, you know, when they need to talk to them because they're not doing well. And uh, yeah, I, some of you can relate, right? And, uh, and you remember those Southwest commercials, right? You know, want to get away, want to get away? Well, I saw this particular meme and, you know, it kind of goes along with that. How bad do you need a vacation? You got the picture of me on top of the plane there, holding on as they're getting ready to take off. Yeah, that's pretty bad, right? Well, there was a man that was known to his friends as very stingy, and he was looking for a gift to give one of those particular friends on his birthday. Everybody, everything that he came across was too expensive except for this glass vase that he found that had been broken, which he could purchase for almost nothing. So he asked his store to send it, hoping that the friend would just think that it was broken in transit. Well, in due time, he received an acknowledgement uh, back thank you card, and the, 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 the card read this way, thanks for the vase, it was so thoughtful of you to wrap each piece separately. The Bible says, know your sins will find you out, right? Well, I say that because God has given each one of us a gift, an incredible gift, it's a free gift. We're talking about the gift of, of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I wanna talk about today is the Holy Spirit. Look at me at Ezekiel chapter 37. Let's begin reading at verse one. The Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. And then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath in you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscle on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying we have become old dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this incredible, incredible uh, passage of scripture as Ezekiel gives us words from the Lord about the person of the Holy Spirit, about the power of the Holy Spirit, about the presence of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, speak today. Holy Spirit, anoint me. Speak words today that will just touch our heart, that will just bring us into a place of acknowledging your presence in our life and living in your power. We just thank you for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do as we are open to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, today we're beginning a new series of messages I called Persist. It's about really getting through life with your faith intact. 
Now, in this particular series, we're actually going to examine four key elements that are necessary for a dynamic spiritual life. Now, in week number two, we're gonna talk about the foundational benefits of a relationship with God, the, the assurance that you can have in knowing that your relationship with God is intact. In week number three, we're gonna examine living a life of worship. In week four, we're gonna address dealing with the storms of life that come our way. But today, we're talking about the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you ever heard that song, Dim Bones? Dim Bones. Maybe you sang it when you were a kid like I did. You know, the only part I can remember really goes like this. Uh, the toe bone's connected to the foot bone. The foot bone's connected to the ankle bone. The ankle bone's connected to the shin bone. And, then, and on and on it goes through the remainder of the skeletal structure of the human physique. Now, we sang it when we were kids, many of us did, but, but I didn't realize until many years later that it was actually connected to the passage of Scripture that we read a, a few minutes earlier, Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, today, May 19th, 2024, is Pentecost Sunday. Churches throughout the world are celebrating the presence and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which began on the day of Pentecost uh, more than 2,000 years ago. Now, you may be familiar with the story of what took place on that particular Pentecost uh, 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 feast festival. But for those of you that aren't, Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they were filled with power from on high. Well, on the day of Pentecost, which was, uh, uh, again, a festive day for the Jewish people, part of that festival, and, and the disciples were gathered together. They're praying. They're in an upper room together. And the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit came upon them in a powerful way. In fact, it tells us that a mighty wind blew through the place, tongues of fire fell upon each one of them, and they began speaking in other languages, speaking in tongues, the Bible says. Now, on, later on that day, as, they, as, they, as people began to hear them speaking in tongues, speaking these languages that they, didn't, they hadn't learned, but they were hearing them in their own language, later that Peter gets up, preaches a sermon, and the Bible tells us 3,000 people were saved that day. Now listen, it is the work of the Holy Spirit that made the difference in the life of the church. It is the Holy Spirit that empowers us. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts us and, and strengthens us. In fact, Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, he said that if there was one message that he could preach to the church, it would be a message about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how much the difference of the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life can make in your life. You know, some of you maybe are old enough to remember Richard Daly, who was the mayor of Chicago for 21 years, from 1955 to 1976. Now, Mayor Daly was known as a rather forbidding guy to work for. One story goes like this, that, that one of Mayor Daly's speechwriters came in one day and demanded a raise. Mayor Daly responded, as, as can be expected. He said, I'm not going to give you a raise. You're getting paid more than enough already. It should be enough for you that you're working for a great American hero like myself. That was the end of it, or so the mayor thought. Well, two weeks later, Mayor Daly is on his way to give a speech to a convention of veterans. Well, the speech was going to receive uh, nationwide attendance. The news was going to cover this speech. And, 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 and now you have to understand one thing about Mayor Daly that he was famous for was not reading his speeches most of the time until he got up to deliver them. So there he stood before this vast throng of veterans and nationwide press coverage, and he began to describe the plight of veterans. I'm concerned for you, he said. I have a heart for you. I'm deeply convinced that this country needs to take care of its veterans. So today, I am proposing a 17-point plan that includes the city, the state, the federal government to care for the veterans of this country. Now, by this time, everybody, including Mayor Daley, was on the edge of their seat to hear what this proposal was. Well, he turned the page and he saw only these words on the page. You're on your own now, you great American hero. Now, I don't know if Mayor Daly learned anything at that moment with his great ego, probably not, but, but, but he should have learned what all of us need to learn, and that is no matter how great we think we are, we need help. We need an advocate who works behind the scenes to make us who we are. And God has an advocate for you and I, and he is the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've known many people who have given up on trying to live the Christian life because it's too hard. You know, the fact of the matter is, it's not just hard, it's impossible. 
It's impossible to live the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is literally the oil that makes the machinery in your life run smoothly. In fact, let me ask you this. You ever driven a car without oil? Hopefully not. But if you do, you know what happens, don't you, right? The engine locks up and it breaks down. In the same way for Christians whose lives are without the oil of the Holy Spirit in their life, our lives will break down. We will not have the ability to keep going forward. Some of you have been walking maybe in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit for many years. For some of you, though, the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit is a new concept for you. But the fact of the matter is, is that all of us, from the greatest to the least, all of us need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so today, we're looking here at a passage of Scripture that teaches in very plain detail three things that we're going to look at, and that is what the Holy Spirit can do for you, how you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, and how you can live a Spirit-filled life. The passage that we're looking at here is Ezekiel chapter 37. It's the story of the valley of the dry bones. Now, this passage, I think, teaches us a great deal about the Holy Spirit. The first thing, as we get right into it, the first thing I want you to notice is what the Holy Spirit can do for you. We live in a culture today where it's really all about what, what benefits me. What kind of benefits do I get from this? How am I going to, to, to prosper, to benefit from, from doing this or having this or, or whatever? We always want to know what the benefits for us is, right? Well, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it'll benefit you in four ways. First of all, number one, the Holy Spirit revitalizes your life. He revitalizes your life. Let's take a look at verses five and six. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm gonna put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscle on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now skip down to verse 14. Verse 14 says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live again. That's what the Holy Spirit does for you. He revitalizes you. He takes you from the point of just merely surviving to the point of thriving. I'm talking about of truly living. He changes your life from black and white to the wonderful world of living color. He changes your life from mono to stereo, from standard definition to ultra high definition. You know, literally from, from going from, from being a moped to being a Mercedes. He revitalizes your life. He infuses you with freshness and with newness. Now, another thing, though, the Holy Spirit does for you, another benefit is that he renews your hope. Take a look at verses 11, 12, and 13. He said, then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying we have become old dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O my people. I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O my people, you will know that I am the Lord. Now what is he doing here? He's renewing their hope. He's renewing their hope. He's giving them hope, renewing that hope that they once had. Let me ask you, have there been times in your life when you felt like the people of Israel felt here? Have there been times when maybe you've said, oh man, my bones are dried up. My, my hope is gone. I feel like I'm in a desert place. Like I, I feel like I'm just dry. I think we all have. Well, the presence of the Holy Spirit changes your perspective on life. I, in fact, I think the greatest benefit of a spirit-filled life is the absence of despair. Because he renews your hope. That's what God does. He gives you hope. He gives hope to each one of us. That's the message of the gospel, that there is hope for you and it's found in a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, Paul says that the Holy Spirit is given to us as a deposit. He says the Spirit is God's guarantee. In other words, his deposit that he will give us the inheritance that he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. He's saying basically here that the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is a guarantee that you're going to get through this life. No matter how dark it may seem, no matter how dry you may feel, no matter how desperate things might be, the Holy Spirit will keep your hope alive. The greatest benefit of the Spirit-filled life, I believe, is the absence of despair because you know that he's there with you walking with you, and he's got a future and a plan for you. Now, the third thing the Holy Spirit does for you is he restores your dreams. 
Look at verse 14. He says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and, you will, and I will settle you in your own land. Now the people of Israel had a dream of living once again in their own land. Now when these words are spoken, you have to understand, when they were spoken to Ezekiel here, the, the people of Israel had been living for years in exile in a foreign land. And God was saying to them, do you know that dream that I gave to you? Well, don't give up on it. I'll restore it. And you know what? He'll do the same for you as well. Too many of us go through life thinking that it feels like we're living in exile. Like we're not living where we're supposed to be living. We're, we're living in a foreign land. You know, we live like we've been banished from our homeland, banished from the benefits and the promises that all God's children can claim. Listen, if you're not walking in victory, you're living in exile. If you're not experiencing power over sin, you're living in exile. If you're not filled with joy and peace and hope and love, then you're living in exile. And God didn't create you to live in exile. He created each one of us to experience the benefits of, of our heavenly citizenship here on earth. And it's through the fullness and the power of the Holy Spirit that we can experience the fullness of life. In him, we experience life as it should be lived. Now, the fourth benefit, the fourth thing that the Holy Spirit does for you is he infuses you with power. He infuses you with power. Now, my granddaughter, Hope, uh, she just graduated from college and she's uh, getting married and she's been looking for a, a car. So I've been out helping her look for a car. And one thing I've noticed about cars right now is that they've, they've, they've taken and they've put these really small engines in cars today. Very small, very weak engine, little, little three-cylinder, four-cylinder engines with not much power. And then they've added a turbo to the engine. The turbo boosts the power greatly, right? It gives it that extra boost of power. Now they do this so that, uh, so that you can have the power you need when you need it, but when you don't need it, when you're just coasting or going at a constant speed down the highway, you don't need the turbo, so it's just using a lot less gas. And that's, that's their goal. You know, and, and, and that's what the Holy Spirit is. He's like that turbo on that engine. He gives you the power that you need when you need it. You see, the early church received that kind of power. In fact, Scripture tells us in one place they received boldness. Another place it talks about the, that, that they, they, he was able to produce fruit in their life, this fruit uh, that, 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 that they were able to be used in manifestational gifts of the Holy Spirit, of healing and all these other gifts. You know, they, they were effective in prayer. They were effective and powerful in their witnessing. Their love was just overwhelming. Why? Because of that turbo power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit can do for you as well. He revitalizes you. He renews your hope. He restores your dreams. He will infuse you with power from on high and he will give you life as it should be lived. Now, some of you are saying to me, wait a minute, Pastor Scott, I want that. I want to go from the valley of dry bones to the valley of life. Now, how do I get there? How do I experience this kind of difference in my life? Well, let's take a look at that right now. I want to talk about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I want you to know up front, though, that it, it's very easy. Now, let's pause for just a minute before we get into that, because uh, I just want to split a theological hair here, because there's a lot of confusion around this. Sometimes we use the term receiving the Holy Spirit in a way that's synonymous with the term being baptized in the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Spirit. Now, technically, you receive the Holy Spirit when you're saved. When you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, when you ask him to forgive you your sins and you begin that relationship with him and, and you are what we call saved, you are born of the Spirit, as the Scripture calls it, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and, and, and gives life to your spirit. Now, let me just say this. You receive all of the Holy Spirit at that moment. The Holy Spirit comes in, not just a part of the Holy Spirit comes in, he comes in in all of his fullness into your life. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is, is, is taking place in your life. So being filled with the Holy Spirit or being baptized with the Holy Spirit is not about you receiving more of the Holy Spirit. You've already received all of the Holy Spirit. Not, again, not part, all of the Holy Spirit. So it's not about you receiving more of him into your life. It's about him receiving more of you. Technically, we should probably say uh, that, that, that you're, you're surrendering or, 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 or submitting to the Holy Spirit more and more and more. That's what the baptism is about, okay? Is, is surrendering your life to him, him receiving more of you or being able to use you more. So how do you experience this fullness 
of the Spirit. How do you get that? Well, first of all, number one, you ask for it. You ask for it. In fact, asking may not be a strong enough term. I think a better term may be you speak it or you claim it. You claim it. Look at verse number four. Verses four and five says, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. You see, the fullness of the Spirit is God's promise to all believers. God has promised every one of us that the Holy Spirit's residing inside of us when we accept Jesus, and he's promised to us that as we yield ourselves completely to him, that we'll experience that fullness of, of the Spirit. It's a promise that we can all claim. It's a promise that God can certainly deliver and will deliver if we ask for it. But if we don't claim it, if we don't speak it, if we don't ask for it, we'll never experience it. We'll never experience it. You know, I'm reminded of when the, the time that I first came to that understanding. I remember first coming into hearing this kind of teaching and realizing that I, I never yielded myself completely. I've never, I'm not experiencing that fullness of the Spirit in my life. And I remember going to the altar and, and praying. And I was, I was up there praying and asking God. And, and I remember there were people around me praying. And, and, I, and I remember uh, one person over here, you know, telling me, you got to let go. You got to let go. And this person over here was telling me, you got to hang on, brother. You got to hang on. And there was a lot going on. And I remember receiving myself uh, uh, one time when nobody was around and I remember I'm driving down the road and it was one of those times where the, just the, the spirit of God was just powerful in my car as I'm driving down the, an old country road and I remember at that point really just receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit as I began to speak in other tongues as the spirit began to speak through me. It was an, it's an amazing experience that, that, that I had and, and it's not, I've not given it up. I continue to feel that presence of the Holy Spirit every day and you can too, but you have to ask. You have to speak it. You have to open your mouth because that's how the Holy Spirit begins to manifest itself through you. You know, there are times though when I have to speak to myself the same way that Ezekiel spoke to the bones in the valley. Sometimes I have to say, Scott, hear the word of the Lord. The Spirit of God is going to breathe life into you. Receive it. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop doubting him. Stop flirting with despair and let God do his work. You know, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 18, Paul commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, that's written in the present imperative tense, which means that you need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time yielding or a one-time surrendering. It is a day after day consistent being filled with the Spirit by yielding yourself every day and, and surrendering to the Holy Spirit's will in your life. Listen, the fact that I think Paul expresses it this way, though, is also an imperative command telling us uh, that, that being filled with the Holy Spirit is an act of obedience on our part. In other words, it's something we do, something that we initiate by asking for it, by claiming it as God's promise. So if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, then ask for it. Say, God, fill me with your spirit. And it's something that you continually do. God, fill me with your spirit again today. I want a fresh filling of your spirit. It's kind of like putting water under a spigot. You know, it's just letting that water run. You know, once you sit it out, water will evaporate. It'll, it'll, it'll start going down. You gotta put it back under. You gotta fill it back up. And that's what we say daily. God, continue to fill me. And we need to ask. Step one, very simple. Step two is also very simple. After you've asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to number two, accept it. Or another way, I guess, to say it is receive it. That's what Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 20, verse 22. He said, then it says, then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, even though we initiate the work of the Spirit in our lives by asking for it, being filled with the Spirit's not something that we can do for ourselves. It's something that God has to do for us. And it's something, though, that we have to receive. We must receive this. We receive the Holy Spirit by yielding to him, by allowing him to have his way in our lives. You know, again, I said it's a free gift. And just like with salvation, salvation is a gift that comes from God. He's offering us this free gift, but a gift has to be received. We have to receive, God, you know, we have to receive that forgiveness, receive Jesus into our life. In the same way, we have to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, being filled with the Holy Spirit is, is really that simple. You ask for it, you accept it, and then I believe thirdly, you act on it. You've got to act on it. Imagine this. Say your banker calls you and said, hey, somebody just deposited a million dollars into your bank account. It's there and it's all yours. How long would it take for you to act on it? I mean, what would you do? 
I mean, you, you'd probably start writing checks, right? Paying bills, making investments, giving gifts, you know, sending a big check to, to your church or, you know, whatever. Or you might say, but you know what? I don't, I don't feel like a millionaire. I don't look like a millionaire. I don't deserve to be a millionaire and, and I don't really see any of the money. Where is it? But the fact of the matter is in this scenario, you are a millionaire and you can live like a millionaire if you're willing to act on it. If you're willing to act like a millionaire, you know, and, and, and act on the fact that, that it's there. In the same way, though, God has placed a deposit into your spiritual account. And he's offered you the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and allowing his fullness to come present in your life. In your account, there is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit, all resident in there. In your account, there are spiritual gifts. There is power. There is life. They're all yours, but you have to act on it. You have to start writing checks, so to speak. Don't wait until you feel it. You just do it. You just do it. In fact, I've actually prayed this prayer before. I've said, Lord, I need strength, but I don't have any. Can I take some out of my account? I said, Lord, you know, I, I, I need to love this person, but I just don't have it, you know, can, can I take some out of my account? Lord, I need power over temptation right now, and I'm completely powerless today. Can I take some power from my account? Now, this may sound like a silly way to pray, but praying this way reminds me that I live according to God's resources and not my own, and that everything that I need in order to do his will is available to me when I need it. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a, a, an elusive experience that we have to spend half of our lives chasing after. It is the promise of God, it is the command of God, and it's available to all believers. So if your heart is right with God, you can be filled or you can be baptized, immersed with the Holy Spirit right now. You ask for it, you accept it, and you act on it. It's that simple. It's that simple. You may say, Pastor Scott, wait a minute, do I have to speak in tongues? Listen, you don't have to. You get to. You get to. You know, you think about it. When I buy a pair of shoes, you know, the tongue comes with it. I don't, have, I don't say, do I have to take the tongue? The tongue comes with it. You know, the Holy Spirit, when you're yielding yourself, in fact, Paul talks about the fact that the, the most difficult part of the body to tame is the tongue. And so when the Holy Spirit gets control of your tongue, when you allow him, you yield your tongue to the power of the Holy Spirit and he begins to speak through you, he begins to speak a heavenly language and praying and, and speaking God's plans and purposes through your mouth, you realize, wow, I get to do this. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Paul says, I'm thankful I speak in tongues more than you all. You know, in addition to knowing how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, though, I think a third thing that we need to focus on from this passage is how to walk in the Spirit. How to walk in the Spirit. A, a pastor friend of mine, I always heard him say this, it's not how high you jump, it's how you walk when you hit the ground. He's right. It's how we live our life. It's walking in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Bill Bright, that I mentioned earlier in this message, he taught a principle called spiritual breathing. And this is the concept. Right now, I want you to, I want you to breathe out, and then breathe in. You know, as we go throughout the day, becoming of the aware, aware of the impurities in our life, we exhale them by confessing them out to God, right? And then we inhale his presence in our lives by surrendering ourselves to his control. That's what he's talking about in spiritual breathing. When you are going throughout the day and you realize that you just maybe had an impure thought, don't wait to repent. Don't wait to confess it. Take care of it right then. You ask God for forgiveness. You surrender to his control again. And you do this all day long, every day of your life. Whenever you think uh, uh, something or you say something or you do something that breaks the flow of the spirit in your life, confess it immediately and surrender control to him. You exhale what is impure in your life and you inhale his presence. The idea is that you recognize and you acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life throughout the day that you walk with him all day long. This is how Paul says it in Galatians chapter five, verse 25. He says, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. I like that phrase. Let us keep in step with the spirit. What's he talking about? Well, I, let me just share with you how, this is how it's translated in the New Living Translation. And I think you kind of understand. 
we, if, he says, if we are living now by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our life. In other words, keep in step, walking side by side with the Holy Spirit, keeping in step with him. Walking in the Spirit is an all day, everyday experience. And, and, and it's key to victory in our life, to experiencing victory in our life. It is a, a, a fruit of being baptized or being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the key to a dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. And so in closing, let me just say, God's promise in Ezekiel here is, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. Anything less is just existing. Anything less is black and white TV. God wants to fill your life with living color. He wants to revitalize you. He wants to renew your hope. He wants to restore your dreams. He wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you can live in his power. Is that what you want? Then ask for it. Accept it. Act on it. And he'll do it. He will fill you with his spirit in a way like you've never experienced before. And then when that happens, beginning at this very moment, start practicing spiritual breathing. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit throughout the day, every day, walking with the spirit. And I'll tell you what I can promise you this. His presence in your life means that you will never be the same. You will never be the same. You will enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life every day. I'm encouraging you today, invite the Holy Spirit into your life. How does this happen? Well, it, it starts by accepting Jesus Christ, accepting the forgiveness that he's offering to us, the free gift of a fresh start, of being born of the Spirit. Jesus talks about being born again of the Spirit. He's talking about receiving Jesus. You say, how do I do that, Pastor Scott? Very simple. If you want to do that right now, get your life right with God, begin a relationship with Jesus, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit in the, in the sense of Him coming and to reside into your life. Right now, just pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for, that you love me so much that you allow Jesus to die upon the cross to take the place for my sins. Right now, I receive that forgiveness I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior. I believe in you and I'm trusting in, in you. And I ask that the Holy Spirit would come. Fill my life right now. In Jesus' name. I want a fresh start right here, right now, in a relationship with you. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer in the comment section, just say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you because I, I, I want to just celebrate with you. And I want to pray that God would just continue to, to fill you to overflowing with the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You know, many of you today, you, you've received Christ. You're, you, the Holy Spirit has come in, in, into your life, but you've never really been baptized, what we call baptized or immersed. The word baptism means immersed. You've never been really immersed in the Holy Spirit in the sense that you've never yielded yourself to the point that literally you've allowed the Holy Spirit to immerse you. Kind of like being, when we baptize, we put people under the water. So it's kind of like being immersed or enveloped in that water. If you've never been filled in that manner and allowed the Holy Spirit to speak through you, I want to encourage you right now. We're going to close in prayer and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come in, in a great power in your life and, and baptize you and fill you to the point of overflowing. And that, begin, and that you, you'll begin speaking in tongues. You'll begin to be, allow the fruit of the Spirit to be prevalent in your life. You'll begin to experience manifestation of the Spirit in your life as He uses you to speak hope into this world. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you today. I thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us helpless. You didn't leave us without an advocate. But Lord, you allowed the Holy Spirit to come and to fill each life that receives you. But Lord, we're thankful for his presence in our life. But God, we want more. We know that you want to give us more. And so Lord, we ask you to baptize right now, fresh, each and every one of us. We want to be filled fresh right now with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray right now that, that maybe even for the first time, people will begin to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They'll begin to receive that, that infilling, that, fill, that overflowing, that immersion of being just completely immersed in the Holy Spirit by yielding themselves, surrendering themselves completely to you and allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of their life. Lord, I know when they do, if they'll just ask and, 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 and act upon it, Lord, and, and accept it, Lord, that you will, will, will begin to speak through them. You'll begin to use them in an incredible, incredible way. Lord, that we can walk with the Spirit every day of our life. Lord, that the fruit of the Spirit would just be visible everywhere that we go. 
Lord, we're asking for the Holy Spirit come. Come into our lives fresh today. Come, fill us. Do what only you can do. And we thank you that on this Pentecost Sunday that we're receiving just as the disciples did in the upper room, we're receiving that filling of the Holy Spirit with the, with the power of the Spirit and the presence of the Spirit. And we thank you for it and give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Go in the fruit of the Spirit today and in his power, and we'll see you next week.